I'd been out of work for six months. Mm. And uh, it was only a month ago that we got the eviction notice. And uh, the unemployed workers union went down to see Carmichael's, that's the estate agent down the street, to see if they could do something about it. And we got promised that they'd take no further action. Then this morning, about six o'clock, uh, Wallopus came around and started bashing on the door. They actually booted one of the panels in and, and broke in. Mm. Started chucking all the stuff out. Yeah. Um, we got to fight them. We just don't have anywhere else to go, really. When they go, we'll try and take possession again. I fought other eviction notices with the, with the uh, union. And mostly we win. Um, well, I've heard there's some work up in, up in Gippsland. Maybe I'll head up there and see what I can find. I'd come from a lower middle class household uh, where there my father had who was a salesman had always been in work and my older brother uh, was in work and so there was there always been a steady income coming in and I'd been working in a Flinders Lane warehouse for three years just as a, a stock room assistant you know on about from a pound to 30 bob a week and uh, but I hadn't I hadn't experienced uh, real poverty and it wasn't until I was I'd left home and was on the dole and I was politically already active of course I was a member of the Uncommonist League and um, became involved in the unemployed workers movement that uh, my eyes were open to the actual conditions under which uh, tens of thousands of people were, were living in and around the city. To me this uh, eviction which took place was really a very shocking thing because um, this particular family uh, had been out of work really quite a long time. Their possessions were really very miserable, very wretched and it was a frightful shock to me to see the wife, I think her name was Annie, and she was only a little woman and it was two or three very, very young children. One, I think, was not there because he or she was in the children's hospital with rickets, which was, uh, I suppose, about the most common infantile uh, disease of the time. And to see them in this miserable back lane just sitting on the bits and pieces of their most intimate possessions, you know, uh, the bedstead and mattress and uh, with all their bits and pieces piled up in the in the lane and the lanes are very very bare and uh, inhospitable a very harsh a very harsh place to have all your intimate personal belongings dumped and you sitting on the top and uh, for me that was a terrible shock and I, I think uh, part of the you know beginning of my real education
All right. Open up. There's police here. Come on. Before the doll was instituted, the Salvation Army in the localities used to have a, a issue day every Tuesday. And, and some of the trade union movements used to have a pound day, a pound of sugar, a pound of butter, or a pound of tea or something like that. I think the printers' union Pure was one of them. Purely a handout system. system. So the, the depression really started in 27. Mm -hmm. There was demonstrations taking place in 27 and a, a fellow, one of the leading figures, and that was Gil Bodgwood. At a time, actually, when Mussolini's Italy gave a doll, there was none in Victoria. Blokes. Have you seen the unemployed blokes? I think the doll came in probably in 1930 or 31. 30, I think it was. 30. Mm -hmm. But before then, and there was quite considerable unemployment growing, you know, but there was no doll here. Amongst the interesting uh, sort of social phenomena of the time arising out of unemployment, I thought, was where large groups of unemployed uh, single men mm. pulled their doll cards. Hey. Hey. Hey, mate. Thank <laughs> you. 
surfing is out of here. They never learn, do they? Come on, boys. Let's get out of here. You see, though, uh, they were politically fairly well developed, but they were a very important group, like the Fitzroy group, because when the um, when there were very serious demonstrations afoot for a higher dole or against evictions and things of that nature, the whole tone of the demonstration was transformed. If it was known that the Barclay Street or Fitzroy boys, if they were going to be in it because they're very disciplined and uh, uh, they really were um, a bit like the commandos. Yeah, well, we used to go to Chapman and uh, Buxton, who's an old estate agent in South Melbourne still. Whenever there was a uh, eviction get on, and when we got, when word, you got of, word of got what word was coming of, up, yes. We'd rally the unemployed, as you say, by yeah. going around the streets and we'd have sections of the town where people had to go and pick up the, you know, yeah. let them know. And we'd go to Buxton's or Happy Jack Chapel and, and uh, say, now look, what are you doing here? Send a deputation in. Yeah. yeah. And the others would be all outside. Right. It was yeah. a bit of pressure. In many cases, it was successful. would take place in the early hours of the morning when people's vigilance was down, you know. And uh, the word would get around very early in the morning that, say, the Smiths or the Jones or the Browns were actually all out in the back lane. They'd been put out. And uh, one of the uh, cruel aspects of it was that often one or two policemen were put into the house and uh, stayed there, say, for a week or so, rent free, of course. But they stayed in to see that the family wasn't moved back in again. major owners of the slum house was there was a fellow named Greasy Loft, who used to live in North Melbourne, I think in Chetland Street, North Melbourne. He slept in a tin bath himself, and though he, had a, he was reputed to be a millionaire, uh, he used to buy up all these slum owners whenever one come on, uh, slum houses, whenever one come on the market, he'd buy it up with the results that at one stage, I believe he owned in the vicinity of 80 houses around the Port Melbourne and 
uh, and South Melbourne area only, and there were houses similar to this. Uh, had no facilities for bathing in them, most of them. He wouldn't do anything to the places. Some of the places he wasn't getting rent from because the unemployed just didn't was have he, the rent. Was he an active evictor, Tom? Was he, he was an active yes. evictor. <laughs> How's it going there, Jack? Oh, it's pretty quiet at moment, sir. I had many occasions when I was uh, president of the Port Melbourne unemployed there to go to him to try and prevent evictions. He would go on with them until he had a uh, few of his houses simply got pulled down and disappeared overnight and reduced the firewood. Well then, even Lock got the meshes and, st and stopped the evictions. The houses, particularly the wooden ones, you know, were often very, very flimsy and ramshackle. And it only needed going along in the early hours of the morning and pushing the front door down and our front window and run a, a stout rope around um, from the window through the door and a couple of fellows give a heave and down they come the front wall without any, any trouble at all. Mm. Okay, come on. They come out about 1924. They'd been evicted out of it. 
and they Bunsley gun and Clyde called for some assistance to do something about it. They approached the local council there in Bunswick in Sydney Road where the town hall was. They had to see if it was possible for them to get a house. They said they wasn't going to intervene in it. So the results was that after a discussion with the Brunswick people, we decided to take all their furniture and put it outside the town on in Sydney Road, Brunswick. They laid the table out, that little table, and a few cooking utensils on the tables. And it was the old cable trams in, and everything was bloody well held up. And there we sat the family around the table. Well, there was police come from everywhere. <laughs> Remarkable thing that a house was found very quickly. A doll was only achieved through struggle. It's through struggle. It was purely yeah, through, through demonstrations and struggle. There. Struggle. Mm. It was forced out. Forced yeah. out. First grey light of dawn's pushing out the window pane. So fare thee well, my blue-eyed girl. It's time to part again. The rain can cry our tears for us. The wind can sing a song. A song can be our memory back along the road we've come. There's many things we've got to do. There's poems I've got to say. To mountains far away. Will I tell them of the time we shared and the songs I sing today? Yes, and I'll tell them of the things we've learned before our parting. Turn to plowshares and 